Welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. I am really thrilled to have with us uh, Congressman Mike Waltz from Florida. Mike is chairman of the House Armed Services Subcommittee on Readiness. And Congressman Jason Crow from Colorado, also from the House Armed Services Committee, also ranking member of the House Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on Oversight and Accountability. Thanks to both of you for, for coming. Thanks, thank you. And thanks to both of you also for being leaders in the House on a range of issues, including holding Russia accountable for its invasion of Ukraine, as well as for uh, helping prepare the U.S. government for its competition with the Chinese Communist Party and the People's Republic of China as well. as are uh, two of the most important issues that the U.S. is dealing with right now. And thanks to both of you for your service, too, uh, as, uh, uh, in U.S. Army Special Forces. I, I had the particular honor of working with Mike in Afghanistan. So. Um, Maybe next time. Uh, <laughs> too soon. Uh, too soon. Yeah, too soon. Yeah. That's right. Well, sadly, there may be a next time. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, that may be a topic for another, another conversation, yeah, yeah, although sure. maybe we'll have time for that here. The focus really here is on the state of the U.S. defense industrial base um, in an era of strategic competition. And so I, I wanted to start off with uh, your perspectives, uh, uh, Congressman Waltz, you first. Um, on Ukraine, um, your sense of some of the challenges the U.S. industrial base has faced uh, in aiding Ukraine right now. There's been a lot that's been in the newspapers about javelins in the lines, uh, stingers, 155 millimeters. What's your sense about the challenges right now the U.S. industrial base has faced in, in Ukraine? Well, I mean, industrial policy has suddenly become a cool hot topic again. You know, I'm, after, I'm working on it right yeah, now. So, <laughs> right. Yeah. you know, after after the 20 years of of both the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, there there just weren't the kind of stresses on the system. There were new technologies that had to be developed, but they weren't. They nothing really had to be necessarily developed at scale in mass. Uh, uh, frankly, I think most people thought that we were beyond the days of a massive land war in in Europe. Uh, post Cold War, so that has certainly, I think, exposed a lot of a lot of gaps, a lot of flaws in the system. We have uh, a, a continuous kind of mantra in both the Pentagon and I think national security circles of divest to invest. But typically, when we do that, the divestiture uh, is to save money, to modernize, invest, and begin new production. But it leaves a bathtub. Uh, you know, it leaves kind of a, a, a bit of a, a bit of a dip. And as we invest in new systems, we close down those old production lines. Uh, we let a lot of the technology, frankly, you know, the world moves on and we, and we tend to lapse. And now we're facing a situation where we've, ex I think we've provided over a million round, ar ar artillery rounds. Uh, we've provided all types of munitions uh, across the board. We had the stocks to do it, fortunately. Um, I think for mainly left over from the Cold War, uh, but uh, those stocks are are becoming stressed. Uh, I am. I know that is used by many, and I just want to say this as a as a reason for not supporting Ukrainians. And look, at the end of the day, uh, they're willing to do the fighting and dying bravely as they are for all of our freedom, and they're asking for the beans and bullets. I think that's a worthwhile. Uh, investment. Um, but I think uh, the other thing that is exposed is the entire supply chain, not ne necessarily having the artillery round ready to go or the tubes, um, but do we have access to the supplies of steel? Do we have access to all the critical minerals? Uh, I'll tell just a quick story. Uh, one of the things that we saw through this was the Defense Logistics Agency came to the committee having real concerns about ammunition, the ability to produce ammunition and the cost of it. And as we, long story short, as we kind of pulled the thread on that, we found out that you know, uh, an element called antimony, uh, which is absolutely essential, can't make a bullet without it, used to be mined extensively in the United States. They've all closed for various reasons. Uh, mainly regulatory and environmental. Bottom line, the only three places in the world that mines and produces antimony now, which you have to have for a bullet, is Tajikistan, Russia, and China. So we're now uh, creating a strategic stockpile of antimony. We are enhancing the broader 
uh, critical mineral stockpile. Uh, but I think it's exposed not just where we have enough you know, uh, of a stock of X, Y, and Z, but do we have access all the way down? And in many cases, we do not. If we could pull up the um, uh, figure three, the volume of global casting, this highlights one of the issues. If you look at global casting production, uh, China now makes five times the number of um, castings that the U.S. does. These are critical for the defense industry. And if you broaden that to, yeah, so if you look here at uh, China, that's the top uh, line here, uh, you, you see China dominates the global casting market right now. And, it, and if you include anodes and cathodes and lithium, uh, a range of the materials that go into batteries, which are critical for our weapon systems, uh, the Chinese are dominant. Rare, rare earth metals, I yep. think you mentioned, yep. um, that's certainly a major issue uh, as, as well. Uh, so I, I want to turn to you just to start off on Ukraine. We're going to broaden it, um, and Congressman Waltz noted this as well, we'll broaden it to include uh, the Indo-Pacific and other places. But your thoughts on Ukraine right now and uh, to what degree the U.S. has uh, faced challenges in giving the Ukrainians what it needs and also has uh, sufficiently for other contingencies uh, and what the, you know, your sense about what the department is doing right now, Department of Defense is doing right now to backfill. Yeah, well, thanks, Seth, for, for having us. Uh, really appreciate it. And thank you to CSIS as well. Uh, always good to join my friend, Mike. Uh, thanks, I yes. feel much smarter when I'm hang, hanging out with a Green Beret here. We have a great collaboration, though, yeah. and do a lot of great work together. So good to be back with you, Mike. Sure. Well, I mean, I, I, I wanted to push back a little bit on this notion that um, we, were, we were woefully unprepared for Ukraine. Uh, and and we, we kind of know that now to be true, but there weren't a lot of people that were thinking that this contingency would happen. First of all, it was only about two years ago that we saw the indications that Putin was going to launch a massive conventional invasion of Ukraine. Uh, secondly, nobody really believed us other than our own intelligence community, and we embarked on a pretty robust effort to try to warn the rest of the world, including the Ukrainians, about this. Then the third is, um, not many people thought that the Ukrainians would be able to survive and fight and win. Right? There were very, very few people that would say that we would be in this position today, a year into the war, where the Ukrainians are not only fighting, but they're winning in many places uh, and enforcing forcing Putin in the Russian army into a massive war of attrition in, in Europe. So, uh, um, you know, hindsight's always 2020, and we can go back and say we were unprepared, but this really wasn't a contingency that most people were really planning for, right? We, we had been looking for years about how we get more efficiency into the system, mm -hmm. how we get more value uh, in, uh, uh, for, for our costs out of the system. And when you talk about efficiency, a lot of times what you talk about is reducing stockpiles, mm -hmm. right? And, 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 and uh, producing quickly and fielding quickly, but not having the stockpiles, which of course are very costly. So we're just in a different world now, and I think that requires a different level of assessment. So where we are now and what we need to do, uh, first is the personnel front, right? You look at our defense industrial base and the number one issue that all of them say across the board in terms of capacity to produce is personnel. They don't have the people to make the weapons and equipment that we're asking them to make. Uh, and a big driver behind that is security clearance issues. You know, 18 to 24 months to onboard somebody and get them a security clearance, that's just not gonna work. So that's why uh, I have a IAA amendment right now that's gonna do something very unique and it's gonna allow interns and apprentice, apprentices uh, at the high school and college level to actually start their pre-clearances before hiring, before finishing their program, so we can move that pipeline of personnel back in time, uh, and, and they'll be ready to go, they'll be cleared on day one. So we have to re-envision the way we're doing uh, personnel hiring and workforce development. The, the second is on the rare earth mineral front, and, and the NDAA, the fiscal year 23 NDAA actually envisioned this. We have a billion dollar investment in making sure that we're doing a comprehensive assessment of rare earth minerals. Uh, we're establishing a working group uh, mm -hmm. to actually look at this within the DOD, and, and uh, the DOD now has an obligation to produce a report, annual report to Congress that outlines shortfalls with rare earth mineral sourcing. So we've certainly made uh, headway on the NDAA in that front, and, and Mike and I and others will make sure that we continue uh, to push on that. But the third is we're going to have to take a different view of our defense industrial base and, and open the aperture to ally cooperation. We're, we're going to have to work with the EU and NATO uh, and do it a little bit differently 
Uh, and, and I know we're, we're going to get some pushback with U.S. industry on that. But things like uh, the uh, Diana, for example, which is the new defense innovation accelerator for the North Atlantic, uh, is going to be a great opportunity for NATO countries to come together to make those collective investments to look at uh, commercial off-the-shelf uh, off technologies to meet immediate requirements in the field those. That's a, a collaboration that we're looking to do with NATO now for the first time ever. Similarly, we just introduced a Future of Warfare Act today, as a matter of fact, uh, me and Doug Lamborn, a fellow Coloradan, uh, for future collaboration with Israel. This is the Future of Warfare Act that's going to create an investment fund with Israel uh, to look at emerging technologies of quantum, AI, um, uh, directed energy, uh, air defense, missile defense. So making those investments and doing more collaboration with our partners and allies is going to be essential to cracking the code. Can I just jump in yeah. on the, the critical mineral front? Twofold. Uh, two, two points. And I was on a supply chain task force where we really looked at this and, and, and uh, you know, would have some difficult conversations with some of my Democrat colleagues uh, at times. Uh, on the one hand, we all agree that we have to have access to these supply chains. Uh, but one of the issues is that on average for a mine, uh, and we'll talk about refining, but for a mine in the United States, it's eight to 12 years for the permitting process. That is, that is basically impossible from an investment standpoint. They just can't raise the capital and they've been starved of the capital. And it's, it's, been, it's an argument that many people are making on ESG, that many people are making in oil and gas, but set that aside. If we agree that these are, and having these mines here at home uh, are critical, then we need to get where the Australians are, which is two to four years, China one. Uh, so we, we have to bring mining and refining back to the United States. Uh, in addition to uh, in addition to our allies, and we're going to need bipartisan help on that because from a regulatory, from a NEPA or the environmental laws and other standpoints, it's just um, it's just not workable. So would it just just to follow up on that, what what's your sense of the steps we need to take to get there? Then, well, a lot of them. I mean, these are these are tough political issues. Uh, a number of them are on federal lands. Uh, some of them. Um, you know, need, I think we could, I think where we can find a, a kind of a sweet spot or some national security exceptions uh, to, to some of these laws. Some of it's both state and federal, I and mean, that's what these miners and refiners run into is it's layered. You know, they, they finally make some progress uh, in, in Washington, which is really hard to do, and then they have a problem at the state level and a problem at the local level. Uh, but you know, we're trying to affect the part that we can affect and to get some national security exceptions. And the administration's credit, uh, they've started increasingly using uh, DPA, Defense Production Act. Uh, and in the meantime, while we're trying to sort this out, we are in a bipartisan way growing the critical mineral stockpile, which frankly had been sold off since World War II. I mean, it was kind of a little bit of a slush fund. Uh, I don't know where all those monies went. Uh, but to get it to the point like the Strategic Petroleum Reserve where we have it in times of emergency, because right now uh, we do not have access. You know, we're reliant not just on another country, but our greatest adversary uh, for many of these minerals, and that's, that is not a position that we, need to, that we can be in. Anything else you wanted to add on the rare earth minerals or, or mining or anything? I, I mean, Mike and I are, are pretty well aligned on this, right? I mean, we obviously need to be aggressive on this front. But I, I, you know, I think something that's worth mentioning since the, the frame of the question was about Ukraine. Yeah. A lot of what we're talking about are midterm solutions, right? Rare earth minerals, supply chain, workforce, uh, you know, addressing the shortfalls that, that, that this war has laid bare. The, the short term problem is that they are going to need this stuff in the next six to nine months or sooner in many cases. So none of these things, none of these supply chain or industrial based things are going to solve it. Uh, and the reality that we face right now, and I've been pushing the administration on this, is we are going to have to tap into our contingencies. We're going to have to pull stuff out of our own stockpiles. Uh, we've been using presidential drawdown. We've been using excess stockpiles. And, and uh, there, there, is a, there is a tension right now between those who don't want to uh, address our readiness and, and change our contingency plans and our op plans uh, and, and are concerned about doing that. My response is, for what other war? Yeah. Like, this is the war, right? And it is somewhat different, apples and oranges, land war in Europe, 
naval, largely we naval will, air war. We'll get to Pacific, that, definitely. Right? I mean, of course, say, there's some overlap. Yeah, but and none of know. us take China um, lightly, right? Yeah. We understand that. But yeah. the, the the cascading secondary and tertiary effects of Russia winning this and, and, the, and the impacts on the West, impacts on NATO, impacts on our own security, we have to put them in a position to win. And I'm of the view, uh, for example, let's, let's use the, the case of Attackums, right? Because there's now readiness concerns about pulling our own stock, stockpiles of Attackums. I think we do it, right? This is, this is a sh shifting of risk. This is a risk shifting exercise. Uh, and, and I think it's worth tapping into some of our own reserves here and changing some of our op plans if necessary in order to, to help the Ukrainians win. So just on the attackums, because uh, it's, a, it's a useful case to look at, uh, there clearly are advantages to using the attackums. They've got longer range than what we're currently putting on the high Mars. That has advantages. There are some that have uh, raised some concerns about escalation, that they're potentially escalatory. The Ukrainians could uh, conduct strikes into Russia. What's your, what's your yeah. response to we that? Were in, uh, we were in Ukraine before the war. You know, the, we saw the buildup. Before the war started, stingers were too escalatory. Harpoons were too escalatory. Basically, everything they were asking, the high Ukrainians were, were asking, escalatory. high Mars yeah. were too escalatory. I mean, we have, right. we have seen uh, uh, this administration continually be deterred uh, by its own, you know, over concern about uh, escalation. What Putin, let's, let's make him worry about it. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, rather than us constantly restricting ourselves. Um, and, and, you know, I, I'm in agreement. Let's give them what they need uh, to win. Let's define what that looks like, which really hasn't been clearly defined. Uh, and hopefully I think if we would do that rather than getting to the right answer about six months and just horrible uh, casualties too late then I think we'd actually be in a better place in the long run. When, when there's a resistance to changing the nature of support or creating additional support, it usually falls into one of three categories or sometimes several of the three categories. The first is you'll hear that the Ukrainians can't use it or don't know how to use it, right? Or that they don't need it. it takes too long to train. The, the, the second is that it would be escalatory. And the third is that it would impact our own readiness. So let's talk about those very briefly, right? The, the first is, the Ukrainians have shown time and time again that they know how to use these things, that they overperform everybody's expectations. And when people are fighting for their survival and for their children and for their homes, they tend not to ask for things they don't need. Right? It is an imperative. They're not going to ask for things they don't need and don't know how to use, and they're overperforming everybody's expectations. So we've kind of dispensed with that one. The, the second on escalatory, as Mike uh, outlined you know, very adeptly, um, the Ukrainians are not going to jeopardize our aid. We are their single biggest supporter and patron. They know that if they misuse something, that we'll cut them off and that will tamper, uh, d damper our aid. Uh, and they've shown the responsibility and the use of our aid. So that's less of an issue. And then the third on readiness, to my last point that I made a minute ago, this is the war, right? That, that we have to help them fight and win. That's going to have lots of other effects around the world and with great power competition. So it is worth, in my view, taking some of that risk, uh, tapping into our own reserves, uh, and providing them what's necessary to win. I'll just put a small caveat on there. I would want a very close look and scrutiny. Uh, I agree with Jason in the sense of this was intended for the UCOM theater. It's largely land-based. But if they were items that were needed uh, in the Indo-Pacific, I would want a lot of scrutiny before we tapped into those contingency stocks. Because what we do have for example, out in Seventh Fleet in Japan, in terms of stocks, is not sufficient in and of themselves. So, I, I'm partially in agreement, yeah. but would certainly want to tap the. Well, I agree with scrutiny. No doubt about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Before yeah. is anything that Admiral Aquilino or Indo Paycom thought they needed. So I've got two questions uh, that come from this discussion. If we go to Figure One for a second, this is uh, our general assessment of the status of the U.S. inventory. It's a couple weeks dated. But if we look at um, especially the first categories here of javelins and stingers, uh, our general assessment is what the U.S. has provided uh, to the Ukrainians has led to a, or at least by late January, early February, had, had significant impact on the status of inventories for some of those. Now, since then, and uh, partially with the NDAA, 
there have been efforts to um, a increase those numbers uh, to the defense industry and two um, to start to authorize multi-year contracts. So I guess my, my question with you first, Congressman, is your sense about um, how some of the recent efforts that Bill LaPlante and others uh, have taken, have, have they started to address some of these challenges that industry has faced on the stockpiles and the inventories? Yeah, they, they have, in my view. I mean, the DOD has formed a tiger team around this issue. Uh, they, they certainly are taking it seriously. I, I, I haven't had any concern that they're not A, aware of the issue, and B, taking it seriously. I think they are very aware of what's going on, and they're taking it seriously. And 100% we need multi-year contracts, right? DOD can't do that. They obviously need contra uh, a Congress to, mm -hmm. to, to authorize that. And it's, and it's far past time to do so, right? You, you cannot ask a, a private company, and we have, a, we have a private defense industry in America, uh, and those companies have fiduciary, legal fiduciary obligations to their shareholders, uh, to their owners, uh, to, to not take risks. And, and they are not going to hire people. They're not going to increase their supply chains. They're not going to uh, contract with, with their vendors uh, if they don't have the certainty to do so. They, actually, in many cases, it would be a violation of their fiduciary duties to do so. So uh, I think our obligation now is to extend to those multi-year contracts, which would allow them to open up those supply lines to, for them to subcontract out uh, and to hire the folks they, they need to solve this in the, the midterm and long term. Yeah, and look, uh, just the key is giving industry a, a consistent signal. I mean, we can't, we can't allow things to go cold and then suddenly say go. Right? They don't have the facilities, they don't have the workforce. Often the technology has completely lapsed. Many of these things we literally don't even make anymore. Um, so I think a consistent signal and a consistent budget uh, and getting it done on time on, from Congress's standpoint will, will be key. But I, I think generally we're heading the right direction. I want to come back to one of the points you made, Congressman Waltz, earlier about, um, uh, about uh, wanting to make sure that uh, the U.S. doesn't uh, use inordinately systems that it may also need for um, uh, the Indo-Pacific. There, there has been some concern among some senior folks in the Department of Defense. There's, there's been a debate about, uh, you know, there, there's a whole set of weapon systems that we'll get to, uh, long-range anti-ship missiles, which or tomahawks, uh, that, that we're not, the U.S. is not going to provide to the Ukrainians. So that's, that's an Indo-Pacific issue, and that's a separate challenge that we'll talk about. But there's, a, there's, a, there's another set of weapon systems, the uh, guided multiple launch rocket systems, or Gimlers, uh, the Stingers, the Javelins, which have a utility in both theaters, in both Europe and the Taiwanese have expressed uh, an interest in increasing their stockpiles. When you look at um, roughly the O plans that the U.S. has for both Russia and China, we continue to use the number of some of those weapon systems that we're using right now. It there, there is a potential for risk in, in both the o, Russia O-Plan and the China O-Plan. So how are you, how, how, do, how do we square yeah, think, this? Yeah, you know, kind of Venn diagram, right? There's things that are really only appropriate for European land war, that theater, and then some for the Indo-Pacific. It's where we really need the scrutiny is where, that, where those two circles overlap. Uh, and uh, I'm, in, I'm very concerned. Uh, I can't, won't get into the numbers, but in terms, I can tell you a priority, uh, two top priorities for, for my subcommittee on readiness, which has responsibility uh, for industrial-based policy, but also for global logistics and maintenance, is one, uh, pushing our stockpiles, our own stockpiles, uh, out of Hawaii uh, and even out of Guam to the extent possible and get them distributed and pushed west of the dateline. So that's one. Uh, two is in the Taiwan, um, in, the, in the recent uh, legislation that we passed, I think it was the Taiwan Reassurance Act, uh, but also in last year's uh, NDAA, we passed authorizations for additional stockpiles on island. Uh, and, the, and I think it's important to put out there, and the Taiwanese government increased their defense spending. Not enough, in my view, but a substantial increase. So I firmly believe that a harpoon on island today from a deterrent standpoint, but also actually operationally 
uh, is worth probably 10 LRASMs if, God forbid, uh, we enter into some type of conflict. And so, one, uh, we've recently uh, passed a drawdown authority for Taiwan uh, to begin go ahead and giving some of those critical stock uh, critical items out of our stockpile. And then two, and this gets very tricky, is we need to, I think, look very aggressively from a, from a diplomatic standpoint, a mill-to-mill -mill standpoint uh, at third-party transfers in other countries. Many countries are very reluctant to do that uh, because of kind of wolf warrior diplomacy from the PRC and the pressure and the economic coercion that the Chinese put on them. But I think those are that drawdown authority, those interim uh, third party transfers to the extent we can we can do that and countries are willing to do that. Uh, and then um, their own domestic production. There is a domestic harpoon version that uh, or, or anti ship missile that they have are kind of three legs of that stool. But we're in a race against time. So so on the uh, distributed westward. Mm -hmm. is the argument that uh, we need to get them closer to the theater. The, the one, one major advantage we have in Ukraine is obviously it's an open border uh, that we're able to get in essentially whatever we want into Ukraine. Uh, if there was a conflict in, yeah. in, uh, in the Taiwan Straits, that island is it's gonna be tough to get anything into oh, it's a, I mean, it's twice the, the length of the Atlantic Ocean. I mean, the tyranny of distance is, is brutal. Uh, no, uh, one, and then in an A2AD environment, in a, in a long-range missile environment, uh, it's going to be incredibly difficult to push those stocks and munitions in. And then three, uh, we've allowed our, um, our reserve fleet to atrophy in, in really, I mean, almost negligent ways. So by just point of comparison, first goal for 400 ships taking our men, material, and supplies into the Gulf. Now we're sitting at around 40, and they're old. Uh, so we, we have a real issue, a, a logistics issue facing us. So to the extent we can get it pre-positioned, hardened, mobile, and distributed, um, we, so, we have to do it. And again, oh, you're going to hear from me time and time again, we're in a race against time. Yeah, it's not just the types of munitions, it's also pre-positioning them That's in the right. right locations. But protecting them. And protecting them. Uh, uh, in many cases, in, in some cases, for example, with fuel, rather than having a bunch of um, fuel blivets or, or storage uh, uh, or even underground facilities that are hardened, you know, can, we, can we mask some of that in the commercial space? Can we move it? Can we have it mobile? We have our pre-position, our actual, not just our logistics, but our vehicles um, and, and our stocks that are mobile as well so that we're constantly distributing, moving, hardening, and, uh, and you know, keeping the PRC somewhat off balance. And we've spoken to the Air Force also about their operational concepts that are relevant here, like agile yeah. combat employment, which are designed to disperse quickly when the threat levels go so that those stockpiles and fuel and other, uh, other, other critical aspects aren't, you know, aren't vulnerable to a, to a Chinese attack. But there's a huge diplomatic effort with yeah. that as well, right? right. Um, with the various islands that we need to pay a heck of a lot more attention to, but also with our allies in the region. Uh, and you know, fortunately, we're moving in a much better direction with the Philippines. We do have a lot of investments going into Guam. Uh, Japan has really turned the corner uh, in many ways, but we, we still have a long way to go. So I, I want to turn, since we're in the Indo-Pacific, uh, Congressman, I want, uh, I want to turn there. Um, if we can just go to one of the, um, the charts we have here, uh, which is figure two, use of munitions in a possible air campaign. What I wanted to highlight is one of the concerns that has come from some uh, war games, including war games that we've done here at the Center for Strategic International Studies, is uh, that in a Taiwan conflict, the U.S., we, we did one recently, 24 different iterations of uh, Chinese invasion, amphibious uh, invasion of, of Taiwan, that we, in all 24 of those, ran out of long-range anti-ship missiles, El Razms, and JASM in about a week of the conflict. Now, this is a study that was done by Mitchell Institute. 
uh, they ran out after eight days. Uh, so uh, I mean, these are all unclassified studies, but they do raise some questions, and I'm curious uh, if you have thoughts on this about um, the industrial base and its and our preparation. This is munitions for not just war fighting, which is what this is, but also having sufficient numbers to deter uh, the Chinese in this case in Taiwan. Yeah, well, I mean, to, to a little, playing off of Mike's last point here, I mean, we, the, the point of maximum risk, as, as you know better than most, is not on us yet, but it's coming, right? That point of maximum risk is when the Chinese have the capability to conduct uh, offensive operations which, against Taiwan, which they don't yet have. That's coming. I think we have a good sense for when that's coming uh, versus when we can restock uh, our supplies and where we have the enough, uh, enough munitions to supply uh, Taiwan and our, and, our, and our partners, right? And there's an overlap between the two when, when, you know, the point at which the Chinese capability starts uh, where we have not yet restocked our supplies. And that is the point where we have to separate those two timelines through expedited production of our defense industrial base. But one thing that uh, we're talking a, a lot about physical munitions here, but, but China also has a different card they're willing to play that will end this way before stockpiles deplete. And that is their, their cyber operations and their space operations. Right? We know that, that uh, their strategy or their strategy as they are developing it and building the infrastructure is to cut off our ability to communicate and also destroy the cyber uh, operation ca capability of the Taiwanese military and, and, and our military to operate in that area as well. And that's something we can actually do right now. Right? We can be accelerating and making additional investments in cyber hardening, uh, training, uh, joint operations with Taiwan, uh, as well as making investments in our own space architecture, uh, both defensive and offensive. Uh, and that's not something that we've been talking enough about. And I've been pushing the administration to actually start declassifying some of this information so we can have a more open discussion about those investments. I think it behooves uh, some level of declassification so we can actually have discussions about that funding in Congress. Because frankly, a lot of folks just don't understand yeah. the, these concepts and, and what uh, role space and cyber is going to play, and we need to, to jumpstart those conversations. I mean, along those lines, too, uh, you know, we'll, we'll come back to conventional, e even nuclear issues in a moment, but um, I think Congressman Crow brought up an interesting uh, example with cyber and space, but there's also the irregular uh, domain, too, which is providing assistance much like the U.S. has done historically with the Baltic states, mm -hmm. about in case of an invasion, um, providing them the ability, and that could include even civil defense forces mm -hmm. that they mm -hmm. can resist in case of an invasion. Are we where we need to be to provide Taiwan the ability, not just to have the weapon systems that it needs, but also to face uh, or, or conduct subversive or, or sabotage operations? Yeah, so uh, to answer your question directly, no. Uh, I do think President Tsai rightly sees the need to shift uh, their doctrine and, and, and their defense planning in that direction. Uh, they did pass recently, they, the, the Taiwanese government, uh, a mobilization law. They've extended conscription back to a year. It had been less than four months. Now it's back to a year. They know that their training needs to be more realistic uh, and, and probably more fulsome. Uh, it's interesting if you, um, you survey a lot of young Taiwanese, uh, they just don't take military training very seriously, kind of sitting around a lot and um, not really having realistic, uh, difficult exercise um, and, and, and training where, where they need to get. And then also, you know, you're starting to get into kind of domestic firearm uh, registry, ownership, caches. Uh, so there, there is a recognition they need to head in that direction. And we are, uh, particularly the special operations community, are working with them to move more towards a partisan resistance model. At the end of the day, when every time she thinks he looks across the strait, thinks he can do this quickly, uh, and thinks that um, uh, it will, you know, the, the Taiwanese will fall with very little resistance. We need to, you know, he needs to see the message back that not yet, not now, uh, and that increasingly uh, they will get bogged down on the island with a, with, you know, with a Ukraine-style 
resistance. I think one of the lessons that we're seeing the PRC learn from Ukraine is that if given time for the United States to move assets in place, for coalitions to form, for a global consensus, for the economic sanctions and isolation, diplomatic isolation to go into place, that does not work, has not worked in Russia's advantage, would not work in the PRC's advantage. Uh, so increasingly, we're seeing them want to accelerate their timelines. Anything we can do to slow that down or at least create the perception that it'll be slowed down will help deterrence. Yeah, and that's what it's about in part, deterrence. Yeah, it is. And I, and I, you know, I would add that there's kind of three components to, to your question, Seth. And one is the um, use of special operations and covert programs for resupply, right? Like you made the, the point earlier that we don't have a land border with Taiwan, uh, the tyranny of distance and, and the very big challenges of resupply over an open ocean. Uh, you know, covert and special operations, I think, have a very important part to play in that. Uh, in addition to the pre-positioning and the hardening that's going to be essential. Uh, but uh, pre-positioning and hardening alone is not going to do it. Mm -hmm. There's going to have to be some supply chain, uh, and it will largely um, rely very, on our, very much on our unconventional forces to do so. The second thing we can do right now, again, that's not contingent on the, the very systematic changes in the defense industrial base that need to happen, is the training piece, both mm -hmm. the training within Taiwan as well as here. And that's actually largely um, a factor of two things. We're, we're actually capable of doing it today. I've talked a lot with the Defense Department, a lot with the folks who actually are doing that training already. Uh, and, and they said they can almost immediately ramp up the training pipeline. The problem is, is the limitations that have been established in the number of uniformed mili U.S. military personnel in Taiwan uh, because we're concerned about escalation with China. Mm -hmm. We're concerned about diplomatic issues. So, uh, you know, I think that cat is out of the bag. <laughs> I think it's pretty clear now yeah. that should, we've should cast we a lot. Should we those limitations? I, I think we should. I think yeah. the cat's out of the bag. It's very clear. We've chosen also sides the here. also limitations on operability. I mean, exactly. I'm very yeah. worried about we have, a, we have a, a, a fight on the island, hopefully an all-of-nation partisan resistance, the mm -hmm. cavalry's coming, that fighting through their A2AD, whether that's in space, missile, uh, on the surface, what have you, but when we meet up, understanding blue on green, on red, mm -hmm. where everyone's located and having that common operating picture, much less if you then start adding in Japanese forces operating mm -hmm. from the Philippines. Uh, if you look at that whole picture, this isn't NATO. We don't have those decades of muscle Which is memory. why the training, I mean, yeah. and you look at Ukraine, and yeah. people are amazed with our ability to have interoperability with Ukraine. That's because it started in 2014. That's right. Yeah. We have been doing it for almost a decade green prior, branch. right? Uh, group, exactly. Yeah. Was that 20th group? That, or, yeah, yeah. It, was, it, was, it was actually, uh, at the time, uh, it, was, it was a mix of the groups, but it, I'm proud to say it was Florida National Guard that was, okay. that was Guard. That pulled out just before the mission. So the I mean, it, we, we can and should, though, mm -hmm. uh, lift those caps, put more folks on the island, uh, but also bring some of their folks here and other mm -hmm. places, training grounds around the world to train them as well. Uh, it, but the, the last piece is this will to fight component, right? We, we're not great at assessing the will to fight. Uh, so I have a, a, a IAA amendment actually now, which I, I, I'm sure you'll support. Uh, but uh, what it <laughs> does it, is it you know dovetails sure. off of the 2014 bipartisanship. We're saying right now, right? this the, is how uh, it happens. You know, it yeah. dovetails off of the you know the 2014 Rand study that kind of laid the groundwork for doing a better job of assessing will to fight, and it's going to force the IC to do a, a three case study analysis. It'll look at um, the the fall of the Iraqi army in 2014 under ISIS. It'll look at the, the fall of Afghanistan in 2021 and our, and our misassessment of that. And I'll look at Ukraine, too, on the opposite end, how we underestimated the Ukrainians. And, and overestimated the Russians. And overestimated. And, and look at, you know, what analytical tools did we use? What assumptions did we make? What, what analytical gaps existed? And how we can restructure the IC to do a much better job of assessing will to fight? Because I can tell you right now, I'm not getting really great answers yeah. as to the, the ability of Taiwan to resist which as we know is, is um, you know, you can't then, underestimate the, the issue of will. Well, it, not, not to beat this horse too long, Seth, but our IC are phenomenal, our intelligence community, or de both defense and, and otherwise, counting and seeing planes, tanks, ships, movement, massing. Reading doctrine. But uh, understanding uh, adversarial jointness, doctrine, leadership, training, uh, morale, we, we, 
we had a, just had a mm -hmm. massive miss, yeah. uh, a, a couple of them uh, over, over the last few years. So it's not just the, um, the, the Taiwan's will to fight and capabilities, but also the PRC's own assessment of itself mm -hmm. uh, and, and its abilities. It has not, hasn't fought a war since 1979. In, in, and they uh, didn't do Vietnam, that well either. And they didn't do yeah. that well. So uh, what are, I mean, we're seeing their massive gains in various uh, key technologies, but the ability to pull it all together, both of uh, their own assessment and then our assessment is something that we're gonna work hard to improve. Yeah, and that's, that, you know, the, the intelligence community, and this is, this is hard, didn't get that right entirely on both the Ukrainian and the Russian side. And what's interesting also on the Russian side is other things like corruption start to impact mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the quality of forces, the ability without a non-commissioned officer corps to have initiative at lower levels, right. starts to impact your ability. Right. Um, the uh, having really thought through the logistics side, ran, the, the Russians ran into problems both in Kharkiv as well as the Kiev components of the initial offensive. When I was in, just before the holidays, when I was in Australia, it was the dominant theme mm. of senior Australian officials that I talked to was uh, was will to fight. It was sort of the Ben Conable Rand study on both sides, both both uh, uh, Chinese and then their ability to do it, and then the, mm. the Taiwanese as well. Right. But I wanted to come back to one issue um, just because just, just this gets to timelines. If we go to figure four, which is selected munitions production timelines, you know, one of the challenges, I think, because we, we've talked about various aspects in the Indo-Pacific, one of them, when you get into the reality that this is a, uh, 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 you know, in, will include, will likely include, even for deterrence, long range precision fires. You're talking about tomahawks. I've got block fives here, uh, here, JASMs, LRASMs, uh, the uh, Pac-2, Pac-3 missiles. Those are, you know, as many as 24, almost 30 months for the javelins to produce. So if we're running shortfalls right now, you know, we're talking about on average for, for initial uh, deliveries, at least two years for a range of cases. Are, are we operating with sufficient urgency to try to close these gaps? Or I mean, what's your sense about how urgent the situation is and how do, we, how do we move that fast? There's no doubt it's urgent. And I think we do have the urgency. This isn't for lack of urgency. I, I, I'll just go back to workforce. I mean, workforce is the long pole in the tent here. I mean, you talk to these contractors and the companies making these, these systems, uh, and, and they are not running full supply lines. Uh, they, they, they just don't have the people, right? So we have, we have to look at you know, innovative ways of recruiting these folks, training them, getting them rapidly cleared in the instances that they need security clearances. So uh, we're going to have to do something uh, to, to assist the DOD uh, to, to more rapidly uh, uh, clear these, these employees. Uh, so um, it really is a workforce issue. That's what all the companies are telling me. And it's not just the primes, but it's the subs as well. Because in many instances, the primes are, are waiting for uh, their, their subcontractors and their vendors to provide uh, their supplies as well. So then that, that backup is happening, uh, and it really is this workforce issue. And that's why we have to be looking, I think, first and foremost at that. I do want to come back to the workforce and personnel, but anything else on urgency well, and timelines look, here? I think this is a little bit of a longer term solution, um, but you know, the rubber meets the road with industry on, on how you structure their contract. And so on the supply chain task force that we had on the Armed Services Committee a few years ago, we, we put in measures uh, to get better visibility, some for example using blockchain, um, but really getting be better visibility all the way down the supply chain. But then contractually, how do we start incentivizing having a closed loop? Kind of like, you know, Apple had a completely closed system that it domestically sourced and understood all the way through. Uh, how do we start incentivizing that? How do we start grading your, uh, your bid and proposal when you can say not only I have visibility all the way through, I have, uh, if not control, we have a, a, a full understanding of where it's all coming from. Um, that's separate from the workforce issue, but it is, we hear those two things all the time. We don't have the people and we just can't get the materials. 
Uh, and so that's what we're looking at. You know, how do we contractually incentivize mm -hmm. uh, getting those uh, materials at least out of the hands of our adversary if we can't get it all the way here at home? And I'll, I'll also add, I mean, uh, we, we're going to have to look at uh, some of these more innovative procurement methods like the, the SOCOM you know, uh, accelerated procurement that we use under the global war on terror. Mm. And I'm going to say something that's actually going to get me in trouble with the services because uh, I've right. already talked to the services about this. Too late right this, now. But, You're uh, already in trouble. You know, I, I, I think we should take things like the SOCOM uh, uh, you know, special procurement authority that's been used with remarkable effect where they, they've identified a requirement in the field, they rapidly go to market, they get something commercial off the shelf, and they just put it in the field within months in some cases. I think we, we should do the same and expand that to some of the COCOMs, right? Well, no reason why Indo-PACOM can't identify a requirement and then go out there with, with authority and find something that's commercial or somewhat commercial or dual use uh, to meet that requirement, why they have to go through the services all the time, because it's slowing everything down. So I'd like to see the expansion of that. Uh, and, and similarly, uh, we, we've um, cut funding for things like Raider. You know, I think the, the things like Raider have great promise within the DOD mm -hmm. uh, for rapid acquisition. Uh, we should be investing in those programs instead of cutting them back. So I want to come back to the workforce issue because, you know, there, one of the areas where there has been some of the more significant workforce challenges has been in the shipyards. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when you visit any of the ship, shipyards, you know, for jobs like welders, there's just a lot of competition in local markets for other kinds of activities. So one of the most recent, the uh, most recent announcements has been the next phase of AUKUS, mm -hmm. and we know as part of the, as part of the next phase of AUKUS that uh, that the U.S. is going to sell at least three Virginia class attack submarines, possibly two more. What's not clear to me, and I don't know if it's been decided yet, is to what degree are those new submarines, or to what degree are those. Uh, currently existing ones that would then have to be backfilled for the U.S., but regardless, uh, that has the potential to put some strain also on the shipyards. Do you, what, what, what's your sense about, about the next, I mean, there's some huge positives of AUKUS, but this yeah. potentially, do, does this potentially put strains on an already strained shipyard industry? Well, I'm, I'm from Colorado, so I'm not a <laughs> shipyard expert by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> Uh, but you know, we keep we'll, on finding. We'll stick our, to North <laughs> with you. <laughs> we yeah. keep on finding ourselves coming back to workforce, though, yeah. right? Uh, and, uh, and and which of course ties into Mike's earlier point about multi-year contracts and yours too, Seth. Right? Yeah. I mean, if you're a welder, right, and, and you and you can walk to you know your your opportunity, and and you know there's plenty of opportunities for advanced welders. You're going to go to some place where you know you can have a job for more than a year or two. Right? And that's why making these longer term contracts available to our base is, is very important. Um, but, but, but also... And us passing a budget on time. Passing a budget, which provides which some predictability. So yeah. there's, no doubt, there's no doubt about it. But um, uh, you know, on, on issues of shipyards, I will, uh, defer, I will defer, to, defer the, to, the, to the low country to, folks. To the water guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So just had uh, the, the admiral in charge of, of submarine maintenance and the, uh, the deputy assistant secretary of the Navy uh, over for a briefing this morning. The picture is not good. Uh, right now, our submarine fleet is down 40% in terms of maintenance availability. Uh, I am, um, for a number of things happened in the years during sequestration and during 20 years of Middle East wars that are now coming home to roost and that we're now kind of having to, to, to fix, uh, so to speak. I am confident we're moving back in the right direction. Uh, the CNO has made uh, maintenance and sustainability a key. I mean, it is his number one priority, and they're and they're almost doubling the dollars uh, that are going towards it. But part of that, a key part of that, is consistency uh, in terms of the demand signal. You can't uh, let something lapse for two or three years and then suddenly say, you know, fix it or produce it. And so uh, we talked a lot today about uh, the public shipyards, which sustain, maintain our nuclear fleet, aircraft carriers, ballistic missile submarines, fast attack submarines, consistently outsourcing out to the lower tier uh, shipyards rather than keeping it all to ourselves and, and extending that timeline. 
Uh, so they're going to increase the outsourcing to the mid and lower tier shipyards. Uh, number one, number two is tremendous workforce investments in those welders, those electricians, uh, and 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 everyone that's needed. I mean, it is it is amazing to me that we had about 36 to 40 percent of America that were of our workforce in the late 80s that were bending steel uh, and, and doing these trade related jobs and we're down to 12 percent now. Uh, so this is a much broader societal mm -hmm. issue on the value of a four year degree, the value of a trade, mm -hmm. how we incentivize trades, uh, our maritime security fleets down a thousand billets. Uh, I do think there is a growing awareness and those investments are being made but kind of my theme for today, it's a race against time because we won't see those investments really pay off till probably 2026, 2027. Or, can, I, yeah. can I offer some, some good yeah. news here? I mean, it, it, obviously, we absolutely need to be having the tough conversations and there's a lot of big challenges that we face. There's no doubt about that. But you know, we did pass the Chips and Science Act, which is gonna help make big investments in that ecosystem. Might, it may not help the shipyards per se, but reinvesting in uh, onshoring that advanced manufacturing capability and and you know the, the, that that workforce is going to be helpful but russia and china also have major problems they have bigger problems than we have hmm. right russia is buying microwave ovens and toasters and dishwashers and yanking microprocessors out of them to put them in cruise missiles mm -hmm. that that is not a great system right they have a really really hard time it turns out delivering a payload uh, across the, their border to the, to the extent that you know, they have a 40 to 50% failure rate on many of their missiles and, and uh, their systems. Uh, and you had mentioned the point earlier about corruption. Right? We, we are slow, there's no doubt about it. But we do test, we do have quality controls, we do have oversight through Congress and other mechanisms. And it takes us a long time to build something, but when we build it, it turns out it works really, really well. And it works much, much better than the stuff that Russia and China are putting up. So yes, we absolutely need to, with vigor, address our challenges and improve our systems. But, but Russia and China are not 10 feet tall here. Yeah. Uh, they don't have that transparency. They don't have the quality control checks because they're autocratic, closed societies. Uh, and there's no incentive built into their system to do that. And of course, corruption is endemic there as well. So uh, I think uh, we have to be fair in our comparisons. Yeah, I think the fact in some ways that the Russians um, we're forced to go to the North Koreans for help on artillery does show how deep in the barrel they've had it's to go. It's not something the superpower tends to do, right? Yeah, <laughs> see, well, I hear you. I agree with you on Russia and China. I'm much more concerned. I mean, for example, they have over 50,000 commercial vessels flagged. Now we have less than five. If you take their largest shipyard, just the one, uh, you could put all of ours inside of it just by sheer scale. So what they've done is essentially created a massive industrial base capability for their Navy by the entire world wanting to buy cheap container ships or LNG transports or tugs or, or what have you. So I, I was just on with Marad, the, uh, the uh, Maritime Administration uh, Admiral t today on the way over here. We're going to seek to dramatically increase their program, their grant program for small shipyards. Uh, so that, and these are match programs. I'm a public private sector uh, uh, advocate, but we have to, once we have that little bit of, of government dollar, uh, this isn't massive industrial based policy, but that, that little bit of government dollar that really unlocks a lot of private sector dollars in terms of these investments. And this is for offshore oil and gas. This is for offshore wind. Uh, we have a domestic fleet here that I think we could reinvigor uh, that could be used in time for of emergency if it's moving Marines from Guam to the Philippines. Uh, and so I think that that commercial sector invigoration will really pay us a lot of benefit for the Navy if we can do it fast enough. One last question before um, uh, have you guys summarize uh, some of your key issues is Congressman Crow, for you first, um, uh, foreign military sales in ITAR, uh, I've heard directly from some, uh, some of our strongest allies and partners, including Five Eyes countries, that, um, that our foreign military sales in ITAR processes and regulations are too slow, even if they're trying to buy U.S. 
Um, you know, that's a perspective. I'm not saying that's the right one. I'm not saying that. But we, your, your sense, because we've talked a lot about the industrial base, but there are, you know, Department of State has, has, uh, has a role to play here and foreign military, say, as an, an, an ITAR. Your sense here about where we're at and where we need to be uh, for, for, for those processes and regulations? Yeah, well, uh, you know, one of the lesser known facts is I spent years as an export control and trade sanctions lawyer before becoming a member of Congress. <laughs> That's why so, I'm asking you first. Yeah, I, so I, I you know, spent more time looking through the ITAR and uh, the, the CCL and, and everything than I, I would care to admit. Uh, th there's no doubt that it's an antiquated and slow system, right? I mean, the ITAR, that, that regulatory regime was created in an era where uh, we, we essentially had a monopoly over much, much of that technology. Right. The world has changed rapidly, uh, and now many countries have that type of technology. Uh, so the customers uh, for um, that technology that we would want to sell or those products we want to sell, those customers have a lot of options. They can go to a lot of different countries now uh, to do that, and I think we have to speed that process up. I think we have to be more permissive, but with checks and controls. Right? It is important we have end-user agreements. It is important that we have... Uh, oversight and licensing uh, for stuff to, to prevent that from falling in the hands of our adversaries. Uh, but, but, but it is time for us to uh, open up a little bit uh, and make sure that if people are buying this stuff, they're, they're buying it from us because uh, they do have those other options. And then similarly, uh, I talked earlier at the beginning about uh, some collaborations. You know, my uh, U.S.-Israel Future of Warfare Act, uh, the, the new NATO uh, DIANA, the Defense Innovator Accelerator. Uh, we're going to have to figure out how we can start working with, you know, Five Eye countries, NATO countries, uh, ASEAN and others uh, to jointly develop products and technology because uh, we can leverage their investment, we can leverage their capital, we can leverage their intellectual capital, their talent. We can bring that together in a sensible way. We could speed it up. Uh, it would be better for the U.S. taxpayer because we're not fully footing the bill. Uh, and we can do this in a collaborative way and also at the same time further solidify our own alliances because we still have that alliance network that our adversaries largely do not have. And what they're telling us is they, they, they just don't want military cooperation, but they want economic cooperation too. And if we can bring that to the table, that alliances and, 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 our, and our power will be so much more effective. And uh, uh, just, just to highlight that too, uh, we've seen now uh, HIMARS co-produced with mm -hmm. the Poles. We've seen SM6 and Tomahawks with some of our Indo-Pacific allies co-production. So we are starting to see co-production with our European, uh, key European and Indo-Pacific uh, allies and, and partners. I would just, just two small ads. Yes, I've seen, I've actually seen brochures uh, from, from other countries selling their defense products that say ours may not be as, as good as the Americans, but you don't have to deal with EAR, ITAR, <laughs> their export regime. I mean, that's, that's mm -hmm. it's not a good place to be. Um, I'm less concerned. I, I, yes, reforms are always needed, and the FMS process is incredibly bureaucratic, and we get a lot of state, DOD, Commerce, and the Congress all pointing at each other for those reasons. So it's important for any reform effort that, uh, that you get everybody in the room, uh, and this would be cross-committee as well uh, within the House, and then you got to deal with the Senate. So it's it's you know it's a lot of a lot of hands in that in that jar. However, I'm less concerned with that as I I think we get more bang for the buck with ITAR and export reform. Just by numbers, you're looking at about uh, seven billion in foreign military financing, about thirty in FMS, and 110 in direct commercial sales. So mm -hmm. where Lockheed or Raytheon or Shipyard just sells directly to with the appropriate controls. So just by dent of getting our stuff out there to our allies in a way that's in interoperable, I think you get more bang for the buck with, the, with taking a, a closer look at the ITAR. So, so uh, I'll start with you on the wrap-up, uh, Congressman Waltz, and then we'll let you f finish us off from the great state of Colorado. Uh, what, what, what gives you hope? I mean, the, the, the U.S. is in a, we're in a very different position than we were for the decade or two after 9-11, where it was a focus on counterterrorism in many areas. And mm -hmm. we're in a state which, of Which hasn't gone away. Which has not gone away. Yeah, uh, despite many that's proclamations true. of victory and it's all over. That's true. Had to get that in there. So. Had, that's, yeah. uh, don't disagree with that. Yeah. But we still are. We, we've got the Chinese. We're in a direct war with the Russians, or at least indirectly involved in a war yeah. with the Russians in Ukraine. 
what gives you hope when it comes to the, the, our industrial base, the innovation of uh, Americans or American companies? What gives you hope that, that we'll get there or that we can, we can get there if we do this right? Well, I think the fundamentals of our system are, you know, have their flaws, and we've talked about a lot of them today, but are, are far superior. I mean, Jason uh, uh, really hit a, a great point that let's not overestimate. Uh, we did overestimate the, the Russians in many ways, their conventional capability. And so we always have to be mindful of that, and we have to continue to press our intelligence community uh, to, to, I think, take a more focused look at it, or at least understand where there's gaps. But look, I'll remain focused on uh, untangling our defense supply chain, understanding to the extent they are tangled and having visibility all the way through. Uh, and then if we can't domestically source, let's get them in the Western Hemisphere at least, or let's get them into the hands of, of our allies. That's a top priority for, for my subcommittee, the to contested logistics that we talked about. Uh, if, if God forbid, you know, the conflict balloon goes up, trying to surge those across the Pacific in an A2AD environment with a, with a construct that the PRC has deliberately developed to be able to deny our ability to do that or at least impose such costs on us that we politically and domestically won't want to do that uh, is, uh, is incredibly important. And then finally, which we touched on, the recruiting retention piece uh, in our services uh, and in our, in our industrial base. We've got to have the people uh, to be able to produce the munitions and then be able to operate the munitions. Uh, and uh, and we are, we're, not in a good, we're not in a great place there. What gives me optimism uh, is we have our struggles, but the, the bad guys have theirs. Uh, but also uh, us, plus the Australians, the South Koreans, the Japanese. I'm co-chair of the India Caucus. I think that is one of the most, if not the most consequential relationships of the 21st century, uh, plus our European friends and allies, I think together uh, as, as, that, as countries absolutely interested and willing to fight for the liberal war, world order uh, that we have enjoyed since World War II, mm. uh, we, we can get there and we will prevail. We have lots of friends. That's yeah, true. That's right. All right, you get the last word. All right. Oh, well, you know, a couple of things give me hope. Uh, one is our capacity to innovate, and I think that's because of who we are, right? Free and open societies will always innovate better than closed and autocratic societies because we have the ability to actually have discussions like this. Uh, we, we, can, we, we have great higher education institutions. Uh, we have freedom of thought. Uh, and, and that always will give us an advantage. And we can't take that for granted, and that's why China has actually spent most of their time stealing it from us, because they don't yet have the ability to do that. And they're trying to create it, but they're having a really hard time replicating that because of the type of society that they have created uh, in, in the oppression of the CCP. Uh, so uh, making sure that we are promoting uh, that freedom, uh, that, that innovation, uh, making the investments, getting out of our own way, we're our own yeah. worst enemy sometimes, uh, with that is really important, Sound but like also a making sure Jason. we're closing the <laughs> get also making out of sure the way, we're, man. <laughs> <laughs> we have a lot in common, Mike. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, also making sure we're closing that back door that they're using to steal that innovation yeah. from us is, is extremely important within higher education, within which, within our research institutions as well. Uh, the second is our capacity for self-correction. The fact that we're having discussions like this, that we ha that we have debates on Capitol Hill, uh, that stuff is not happening in Russia, in China. They just don't do that, and we actually see a year in the lack of ability for self-correction in Russia. They have, haven't addressed their problems. We know what their problems are now, better than they do, probably. They're pretty obvious. <laughs> they're pretty obvious, right? But they're not actually moving to address it because nobody wants to deliver the bad news to Putin. Putin doesn't want to hear it. Uh, there's no incentive to do so. Uh, we have the ability to self-correct, uh, and that gives me hope. And then the last is our, uh, our alliance network. We are still, by far, the preferred partner. We're the preferred partner because we come at our relationships uh, uh, with, with mutual respect, uh, with, with a recognition of sovereignty, uh, with, uh, with um, uh, openness. Uh, you know, we have through NATO countries uh, a combined over billion citizens, right? And, and we treat those folks uh, as equals and, and we have tough conversations with them sometimes, yeah. but that's what a family does. Uh, we have that alliance network. It is stronger than it has been in my lifetime, mm. by any stretch of the imagination. Russia and China have failed to develop that. Now, we have to take a close look at 
uh, and be wary of the, the connection of Iran, North Korea, Russia, and China, because they're looking at combining forces. But we have to develop that network, and that includes engagement with the global south. Right? And that, that is up for grabs. Africa, uh, South America, uh, they, they are up for grabs right now. And if we don't make very quick and aggressive engagement and investments in those areas, uh, they will move away from our sphere of influence uh, towards Russia and China, and that will make for a less prosperous world. Well, thank you both for a great discussion. Uh, I don't think, as both of you highlighted, I don't think we're hearing uh, and going to hear these kinds of discussions happening either in Moscow or Beijing, but they are definitely happening in Washington, including on a bipartisan uh, forum. So appreciate you coming to the Center for Strategic International Studies and those of you online that joined us. Have a great day. Thank you.